damn. Right. When I was 23, my mother told me, I was terrified about becoming a mother. I've never particularly liked children. I still don't, honestly. When she saw my face, she added, well, you were different. I mean, you were mine. And we did all of it together. Thanks, mom. But this is the kind of honesty that comes with being the child of Diana Talley who never made me feel unwanted, and instead she showed me what it was to be loved fiercely, even if I had the temerity to be a child. <laughs> now, it wasn't easy for a single white mother to raise a mixed-race black kid in the 80s and 90s, and to love that son dearly, and also be afraid that you're messing it up every day. So here are some times out of the many that Diana Talley got it right. Number one, just do the thing. So in June of 2009, one year into my PhD program, I was due to leave for South Africa, and I was scared shitless. I was gonna spend the summer in a rural village as a full immersion experience for Zulu language students. Four days before my flight, I rushed into the hallway where Diana Talley was calmly folding a pile of laundry. I can't, I can't, I can't do it, mom. I can't fucking do it. I said, hearing my voice crack with the rising panic that I was feeling. Do what, my mother answered with practiced boredom. Her brows wrinkled as she focused on a particularly stubborn shirt, probably mine. Now, Diana Talley has taken care to fold shirts because, as we've both admitted for years, we are not an ironing family. <laughs> fuck am I thinking, Mom? I can't go learn Zulu. I've taken it for barely a year, and I don't know fucking anything. I suck at this. I'm going to make a complete fool of myself, and I'm going to fail miserably. Diana Talley put the shirt down for a second, still paying more attention to the sleeve that stubbornly refused to fold. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. I thought this was a program for people who didn't know Zulu and wanted to learn it. I had no idea this was a program for people who are already Zulu experts. <laughs> go to Africa, go learn Zulu, sing the Lion King song. That's the whole point. <laughs> now I started to say something else, but I noticed she was back at work on that damn shirt. Fold, motherfucker, she said under her breath. <laughs> Number two, Malcolm, my mother, and me. So in the spring of 1999, I was a 15-year-old high school sophomore. Now, I didn't grow up feeling extraordinarily close to my blackness or really understand how I felt about being a person of color. My family did not opt for a colorblind parenting approach, recognizing that I wasn't ever gonna pass as a Chad or a Logan. <laughs> but that still left me with a lot to figure out on my own. So I was unprepared for my school-assigned reading of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Now, I read with horror about how Malcolm's family had encountered murderous white supremacy. I was moved by the formation of his racial consciousness and his sense of justice and desire to combat racism and to make things better. And I couldn't put the book down. I started it on the long bus ride home from school and I kept reading it all afternoon while I waited for my mom to get home from work. Now, about halfway through, I decided to dig out an old fez I'd found for sale at a thrift store, as you do, <laughs> wrap myself in some scarves, and light a series of candles around me as the afternoon sun began to fade. So this was the scene that awaited my mom, <laughs> then a 44-year-old single mother <laughs> who had just finished working a long and particularly grueling day. So she was tired as usual. She'd walked into a living room shrouded in semi-darkness, illuminated only by a few decorative Bath and Body Works candles. <laughs> the room was ominous, yet smelled like cucumber melon? <laughs> and maybe country apple? <laughs> why was it so dark and why was it scented like a gay farmer's market? So as her eyes adjusted in the dim light, she could see me, 
wearing that beat up fez and holding Malcolm X's autobiography. <laughs> My eyes reflecting the candlelight narrowed at her. Uh, hi? Ready for dinner? She offered, utterly confused. I am not pleased with you, white woman, I replied. Nor the imperialist crimes of your race. <laughs> My mom's shoulders sagged. <laughs> now, looking back, I can see her thinking about all of the microaggressions that come with raising a mixed black kid in California and all of the derision she'd experienced from a variety of people as a white woman with a brown child. She heaved her purse on the kitchen counter as if it carried the totality of her rage and her exhaustion. And then she turned to face me. Oh, okay. Is that so? Well, I guess somebody's gonna make his own fucking dinner. White ladies on strike. And she quickly strode from the room and shut the door to her own bedroom. So I knocked on the door and I remember saying, mom, can we have racial reconciliation? I'm too hungry for revolution today. Number three, letting go. So in September of 2001, I moved into my freshman dorm at UCSD with the assistance of both of my parents. So my parents' marriage had slowly crumbled like a rotting tooth in its socket before being yanked out in 1990. But Diana and Tyrone Talley were forever linked by the fact that they had a child between them. And I secretly appreciated that my parents both appeared for graduations and official events. And as a kid, it made me feel like I made sense to outside observers. My mom saw this growing up and committed to this family unit performance at every event to make me feel like I fit in somehow. My dad, who was generally not a part of my life by his own decision, relished these performances. Now, without any effort of his own, he had an instant family to parade, just add water. <laughs> While my dad bragged and grandstanded to strangers all over campus, my mom and I moved trance-like, almost as if we were working underwater. For 17 years, we'd been a team. We'd experienced the millions of quotidian struggles between a single mother and her growing son. And so much of the two of us were bound up in each other. We were like two trees that had grown entangled, the combined architecture of our branches lending support and structure. And now one of those trees was pulling up roots and moving away. I dropped and I shattered a coffee mug. My mom accidentally ripped a big gash in a poster. And my dad laughed really loudly, demonstrating his paternal mastery of precisely nothing. <laughs> while we looked at each other and we tried not to cry. This was growing up, right? This, this was the next step. Finally, we were done. So my dad had charmed plenty of other people's parents and I saw him get the phone number of a woman moving her daughter into the dorm next door. And he winked at me as he slid the card into the pocket. My mom and I hugged, desperate to hold on to the other without drowning in the rising tide of our feelings. Hey, call, call me when you get home, I said with a smile that didn't reach my eyes. Two hours later, I was sitting on my bed, exchanging that awkward small talk with your roommate, when my blue Nokia cell phone rang. <laughs> right on time. Hey, mom, you okay? Hey, 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 I love you. Um, I love you too? You're dad, you're dad. He saw I was a mess. And he took me out for drinks when we got back home. He is an asshole, but he does know that I love white Zinfandel. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for all of this, mom. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. It's gonna be so good. You are so good. Don't, don't, don't. Don't be sad, okay? You're gonna be amazing, I love you. <laughs> Number four, I didn't do it for him. So in 2011, my father's father died. 
Gentry Howard Talley was born in Texas at the height of Jim Crow segregation. He'd moved to California in 1954, fleeing a state that locked him into a second class status and making a hopeful go of it someplace else. He was the loudest, most aggressively cheerful person I had ever met. I called my mom immediately when I found out. And something in her voice shifted over the phone, this like note of resignation and sadness. I'll be at the funeral, she said. So Gentry had taken a shine to my mom when my parents started dating. She was always D to him. And he led the way in insisting that she was the newest member of the family. And for her part, my mom immediately, as a white lady, worked to learn all of my black Texan family's favorite recipes. That Gentry Tally specifically asked for her peach cobbler every Thanksgiving for the next 20 years after my parents' divorce is real proof that she made it. <laughs> yeah. I saw my father for the first time in three years at the funeral. He'd shrunken from this sort of bluff, muscular man that I remembered. And instead, a gaunt man stood before me in a too large suit, jaundiced eyes uncertain behind a plastered on smile. Long time no see, son. Yeah, your mom's here too. She said he was still family to her. He winced at the implication and then said, yeah, that was always good of her. As I lowered my grandfather into the earth, I turned and looked at my mom with tears in her eyes, smiling softly at some memory I couldn't know. And then, to my horror, I watched my father stride up to my mom, weeping, and throw his arms around her, sobbing. And my mom froze. Her arms stood out rigidly, and all I could hear was my dad's loud sobs. And then she held him like you would a sobbing infant. Shh, Tyrone, shh. And he eventually composed himself and wandered away. And I immediately hurried over. It was the right thing to do, she said, looking straight ahead. I didn't do it for him. I did it for Gentry. I will never forget that hug and that offering of love to someone who so little deserved it and yet so desperately needed it. Number five, fuckery. <laughs> On a chilly spring day in 2016, Diana Talley and I walked past row after row of Confederate monuments in Richmond, Virginia's Hollywood Cemetery. Ooh, there's another one. She pointed to a massive monument commemorating Jefferson Davis, the former president of the Confederacy. Go do that one. So I handed her my phone and she quickly shot a snap of me staring steely-eyed at the camera, both middle fingers in the air. Nice. <laughs> I laughed as I rushed over to look and we kept walking step in step. I thought of how this moment combines so many things I love about my mom. Absurd, whimsical, compassionate, angry, serious, and very flippant. <laughs> Diana Talley has taught me how to combine my love of justice and truth with good cheer and the occasional ability to laugh at myself. I'm not always good at it. <laughs> I'm in process. A prime example, celebrating my 32nd birthday by traipsing through a Confederate shrine and flipping off figures of white supremacy and black enslavement. As I posed for the next photo, I watched my mom shake her head silently as she looked over the rows of the Confederate cemetery. It's just so much violence, so much fuckery, I offered, finishing her sentence. Yeah, fuckery, that's it. How are you gonna pose next, she asked, standing in front of yet another terrible Confederate. I honestly have no idea, I said, suddenly tongue-tied. Well, she offered, try something new. Sometimes, TJ, you just have to do things, even if it seems like it's too big of a job. That was the doctor, TJ Talley, everybody.